You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the Options Insider Radio Network for you, the busy financial advisor or asset manager. Maybe you've been dipping those toes into the options waters. Maybe you're considering doing so, maybe as a result of client demand and you're trying to figure out how those first few steps should go. Either way, we've got you covered here. On the advisor's option, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. Reminded you again out there, there's a lot of interesting stuff, particularly for the folks on this audience on the pro side of the fence. Options Insider Pro has some very compelling content. It's been a very busy week on that front, as well as Double Pro Week. We had two, not just one, but two great pro Q&As aimed at the volatility realm Yesterday, of course, Ewan Sinclair, noted volatility author. And then we had uh, Simon Ho, the creator of a number of volatility products out there to talk about all different aspects of the volatility landscape. So if you haven't checked it out, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com. Slash pro is the place to go to learn all about that. And of course, wherever you listen live after the fact, keep hitting us up. Questions, comments, insights. We do love to hear from all of you out there. Let's see who we're hearing from. On the program today, first, we're going back out to the quiet and tranquil shores of New Hampshire, where we are joined once again by the Oracle of New Hampshire himself, a.k.a. the founder of ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services, also known as Mr. Matt Amberson. Matt, welcome back to the Advisor's Options, sir. It is tranquil. It is beautiful. Summer is the time out here, but uh, 
Something tells me there's something new on the show today or something something borrowed. old, something old that is new. Yes, yes. <laughs> something bored and blue and all of those adjectives, listeners, because I am pleased, very pleased that we are joined once again by our old compatriot and partner in crime. None other than the director of risk himself, Mr. Chris Houseman. Easy for me to say. Chris Houseman, <laughs> the portfolio manager, a.k.a. the managing director of risk over there at Swan Global Investments. Mr. Director of Risk, welcome back to the program, sir. It has been too long. Well, thank you very much, guys. Great to be back. I feel like a bear that's been in a cave for six months, so you guys need to fill me in on what I missed. <laughs> but doing the show is like riding a bike, right, after doing it for five years? It is. You fall off painfully at first, but then you get the hang of it again. Just like options trading. Yes, just like options trading. But you mentioned you haven't been on in a little while. It's been pretty much most uh, of 2021. I'm not sure if you've noticed, Chris, but a thing or two has happened in the market since the last time you joined us. So maybe let's start there. Catch us up. What's been lighting up your tape over the course of this mad, insane year that has been 2021, sir? Well, it's been an interesting year. I mean, the first quarter, and again, like you said, I haven't been here six months, so pardon the the six month summary. But I'm, you know, we still had that leftover volatility from the COVID crisis of last year, and then all of a sudden, volatility switched over to this lower regime. Now, I'm not talking 2017 type volatility where you're going to see, you know, tens, elevens, and twelves. But the regime, nevertheless, is you know, the VIX was a tradable product. You know, you see the lower bound at 1415, and then obviously the trade is to sell the spikes. Yeah, I think what's more interesting is really volatility between index products. Um, just the other day, you had a reach in volatility for large cap and small cap, but technology like the NASDAQ didn't really budge. And you've kind of seen that over the last few months where there are these – you have opportunities to buy one index versus sell another index. And, and that's translating into – we continue to also see sector rotations among equities. So there's that thing called dispersion trading, right, where you want equities. You want one sector to go up, another sector to go down. And at the end of the day, your index kind of is ho-hum and does nothing. So that's been working really well, you know, based on what we've been seeing lately. And, and I know you guys have been talking about SKU. Um, it's been extremely elevated for the most part of this year. But it did take quite a, uh, quite a breather here over the last few days, which is natural. You know, again, that just tells me that, you know, with all these – baby puts and lottery ticket buying down below is okay so people are prepared to some degree which means okay if you have the correction people are going to monetize and that's just naturally going to find some support um and then technically the trade continues continues to be by the 50-day moving average i mean that has not changed in a long time if you look at where support is in the s p 500 or the if you're a buy the dip mentality it has been uh, an easy trade, if you will. I mean, obviously, it could change in the future, but buying the 50-day moving average on the S&P 500 has worked very well this year so far. And, of course, since the last time you joined us, we've had this meme palooza unleash itself on the marketplace. So what are your thoughts on that and its impact? You kind of just touched on SKU and its impact there on some of the other elements of the marketplace, like volatility and everything else. Yeah, so I... <laughs> It was the first thing I was telling everybody who, if you started your options career in the last 10 years or post GFC, I, you know, I was telling everybody, okay, this looks just like the dot com thing where you had inverted skews, right? You had the reach for the upside. Now, some of the skews and volatilities we were seeing in some of these meme stocks were way, way higher than back, you know, back during the dot com. But nevertheless, it was the same type of structure, same type of, um, you know, pricing. And what I kept telling everybody is, look, these are still supply side products. Um, they're going through something that nobody really has seen to this degree, um, but it's not going to last. They will go back to a normal environment. And and all the meme stocks and the gamma squeezes, yes, they started out as gamma squeezes, but you haven't heard about any gamma squeezes lately because of what a market maker is going to do to get rid of gamma. They're going to jack the balls up to 500,000, and the gamma squeeze story just ended and dropped there. And so you've actually seen um, a decrease in small lot trading um, and in volume from that retail sector, not in the overall market, which I think is actually a very positive thing. But so, yeah, it was it was interesting. It got a lot of attention. It got a lot of people who have never even heard about options, looking at options. So I think from that perspective, it's a good thing. But, you know, it, it's those volatilities in a supply side product cannot last forever. I've never seen them last forever. So they're very what's that T word? Transitory. <laughs> <laughs> Get you thrown around the T words here. Well, Chris. Buckle in. We got some new segments since the last time you joined us. Don't get thrown for a loop as we head right on into the PL statement. What the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode? Let's find out with the PL statement. All right, buddy. Welcome to the PL statement. Chris just kind of caught us up on his previous six months. Uh, but of course, a lot's been happening 
since our last show. And indeed, even just in the past week or so, a lot's been lighting it up. So let's go back out to the shores of New Hampshire. Mr. Matt, we've seen uh, markets rallying. Then we've seen some aggressive sell-offs. And now apparently we're back in the rally phase. We've seen volatility usually eroding, eroding, and then spike right back up again to the somewhere in the mid-20s right? and then come right back down again. So we're in that kind of moment, Mr. Matt. What's been lighting up your tape out there since the last time we chatted on the advisor's option, sir? Well, it was so nice to hear Chris's perspective. Uh, we've definitely missed that. Uh, so the listeners have been treated to this uh, epic uh, sh- show of the market. Um, you know, what I look at, of course, is, uh, you know, the skew, how that's diverting uh, between the the SPY, that's really steep. Uh, we did get a little bit of a reprieve, but it's it's still quite steep. The, the puts are high compared to the calls. Um, but, you know, we still see some of this residual of uh, five delta versus 75. It's still in the market, in the, in the individual names. You know, we have at ORATS, this uh, component-weighted uh, indexes. So we could see what the average is of the uh, 5 delta at 30 days, for example, and the 75 delta at 30 days. We do that. I watched that race so very closely. It peaked in June. Uh, if, if you could believe, uh, usually the 75 uh, delta is uh, of the calls is much higher than the uh, 5 delta calls. Uh, but now, but it peaked at 11% higher. So the calls were actually higher than the puts in the individual names. And it's still, uh, you know, right now, uh, 1% higher. So it's, you know, it's right around, uh, the vol of, of the way out of money calls is, is, is equal to, uh, the vol of the, the deep, uh, the deeper puts. So, uh, still holding that kind of, uh, uh, Robin Hood effect. Uh, there's still, you know, even though Chris pointed out some of the smaller trades are are waning a bit, they, the the market makers and the market out there is still valuing those out of the money uh, calls quite high. Um, you know, I, I did I did uh, see some uh, interesting behavior in this last kind of market downturn. Of course, it only lasts uh, for one day. Uh, you know, but and it's right back to where it was before. But in that one day, that that was a pretty uh, pretty good spike. Just what, looking at the uh, SPY implied volatility, you know, it was around 11, 12, and then it just it it, it popped up uh, to a, a around 18 and a half. Um, that's a good move for for vol. And what I'm seeing is is I look at kind of an overall trend. So it's been uh, you know, coming down, even the, the, the highs of, of, of the peaks that we've seen this year have been lower than the, the, the past ones. But this last peak got up quite close to, uh, it looks to me, if I had to say something, that we could have an interesting August. From a seasonal standpoint, August tends to be this part of this calendar's higher volatility. So, um, you know, we might see something in, in August. I've seen some some signs of life from a volatility perspective. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, that's what's uh, that's what's lighting up my tape, Mark. And Mr. Chris, same question for you. Obviously, just in the past couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of back and forth in the marketplace. We saw, you know, nice rallies, new all time highs in the Q's and the S and pick your poison out there. Then some chop, some red started making it in. And then we saw some aggressive red on the screen not too long ago coming into today's show listeners were kind of coming back on the heels of that most of the major indices are back in the green they rallied up about around one and a half percent yesterday and today's session looks like most of them, about half a percent if not more so they've pretty much gained back most if not all of those losses from that aggressive sell-off the worst sell-off we've seen pretty much since january out there across most of the broad space and a lot of the vol coming crashing back down after rallying hard we saw Bix cash get up to about a 22 half Earlier this week on Monday and coming into today's show, it's at about 18 and a quarter. So pretty much shedding a lot of that juice that it had just gained back in over the course of the last few sessions. So, Chris, a lot to unpack just in the last week, sir. What's been lighting up your tape out there from a valuation and a volatility perspective, sir? Yeah, I, I do agree we're going to chop around here. So in the SPX 4,400 to 4,500, 
that's a very important level because that's basically a double of the COVID low. So it's 100% return. That's also a lot of price targets and measuring objectives. And this is another area where people are going to do a second take on valuation. So I, I don't think I think it's going to take a lot to blow through this 4,400, 4,500 area, you know, to maybe ultimately one day reach 5,000. But technically, again, we need to test 4,000. 4,000 was a very important breakout to the upside. So I don't know when that's going to happen, but I do anticipate that we'll test 4,000 ESPX at some point in time. But in the short term, meaning over the next four to six weeks, I think there'll be more chopping around. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have these stabs at 4,400, and then we'll see what kind of support we'll, uh, we'll create on the downside. We shall see indeed, listeners, as we keep on rolling. It's that time of the year, listeners. We're kicking off a brand new cycle. So what better way to do so than to dive right on into the earnings volatility report? Earnings announcements can move markets. But what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the earnings volatility report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Earnings Volatility Report. We've been saying for a while now this last cycle wasn't quite living up to expectations. I think it settled out around a 72 74% in terms of bang for your buck if you bought that basket, that proverbial basket of all the earnings announcements over the course of the last cycle. You got back about 70-odd cents on the dollar, so not the best. But we are kicking off a new season. In fact, we are right in the middle of it right now as we're recording this, listeners. We've seen a lot of big names popping off even this week. IBM, Netflix, United Airlines, Chipotle, Coke, J&J, interesting one there, AT&T, American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Amex, Crocs, if you like your rubber shoes, you name it. That's just this week, Twitter, listeners. So we are back in it yet again. So who better to turn to? For analysis, then the guy who's crunching all the numbers over there in the land of Orats, Mr. Matt, we're back in it. We're hot and heavy. What do you have for us these days? So what's lighting up your tape in the land of earnings volatility right now? So just to start from the very top general, uh, you know, implied earnings moves are down a little bit. So that means uh, we have a chance to beat those. Uh, the first week of earnings season, we're in the second week of earnings season right now. It's usually about a six-week run uh, every quarter. And uh, what we normally see, uh, the first two weeks are pretty uh, pretty light from a uh, fireworks perspective, meaning the holders of straddles don't do real well. Uh, and that's the case. It's, you know, it's not as brutal and bloody as it's been. You know, it's uh, 74% versus 81%. So they're losing 26% of your uh, straddle uh, profit there. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we have those magical third, fourth, and fifth weeks, Mark. And can we get, can we get some profitability into people's pockets who are o- owning these straddles? I don't know. I was on a I was on a call this morning with a uh, famous educator, and he does a lot of earning stuff. We were looking at the ORATS report. <clears throat> uh, American Express uh, is overvalued, and so we were looking at that one. Uh, and but a lot of these other ones are, you know, it's if you go down the list, it's pretty close to uh, prediction or the past earnings move is is right near the uh, the straddle. So. Uh, you know, I think we're we're fairly priced here. Uh, we've had some fireworks, but you know, we're uh, we're ex- I'm expecting a lot in in the uh, the coming weeks. Let's just say some volatility in the earnings. I think it's going to lead to some volatility in the uh, in the market. Come come early August, we're going to see some some uh, July Fourth fireworks. Uh, let's say August fourth. Well, you know what I'm going to ask you next, Mr. Matt. Do you think this is it? Do you think this is the moment? You know, we've been dancing on that precipice for quite some time. I thought maybe it was earlier this year. It turned out to not be the case. You went out on the limb last cycle. That one turned back and bit us all again as well. So what do you think? Do you think this is the moment, Mr. Matt, where the worm finally turns and we start to see some actual outperformance from an earnings ball perspective, sir? Well, if you start to peak out into weeks three, four, and five, uh, the market is only valuing those uh, earnings moves at about 85%. So um, they're already starting at a low number, meaning the straddles are are looking like they're going to be low. So I think that we're going to 
at least do some damage in weeks, let's just say, four and five. And I think it's going to lead to some volatility in the market. So that, that's as much as I could do for you, Mark. I mean, you can only squeeze so much blood from a stone, right? And eventually the stone is dry. So <laughs> right. I don't know if we're quite at that level yet, but we have to be perilously close at the very least. As we keep on rolling into our next segment, it is time to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody, welcome to The Buzz, the portion of the show where we break down some of the stories and developments that are going on in the world of options and derivatives. Maybe you've been too busy dealing with your clients. That is your job, after all, to pay attention to them. So we do it for you. And still, pretty much the the biggest story going into 2021, and really still to this day, is can the party continue? And obviously, from the last year and a half, it hasn't really been a party from most people's perspectives, except through the very limited lens of options trading and options volume for the options market as a whole 2020 into 2021 has been the most active period in the history of the business and so coming into this year a lot of people thought maybe we'd see that tail off as we saw you know vaccines start to spread hopefully the the rise and spread of the covid start to mitigate and people are going back to work and things like that maybe that would start to taper off some of the volume so there was a close eye a lot of close eyes really on the volume numbers for this year. And so far, the year came out, just roared out of the gate with a bang. Q1 was the busiest Q1 in the history of the business. Every single month was pretty much a new record month. And uh, coming into the end of Q2 here with June, we're still seeing effectively new record levels out there. June of 2021, total volume coming out of our friends over there at OCC, uh, up 25.6%. From a year ago, remember June of 2020 was no slouch when it came to options volume until this year, 2020 has been the most active year in the history of the business. And so far, year to date volume. So year to date average daily volume is up about 25.6%. So you're talking up about a quarter if it keeps on this pace from what was already a historic level of volume by just about any measure. Now, June was not the busiest month in the history of the business. No, unfortunately. It was the busiest June on record. It was only the second busiest. <laughs> to put that in some perspective, listeners, June, these are the months, you know, we often mock the sell in May and go away. In fact, I usually don't allow it to be said on this network because it's such an abused cliche. But when it comes to options, that from a volume perspective, that tends to be the case. Folks tend to do other things during the summer months and volume tends to peter out. Markets get to be a little bit thin. So, June is not normally a rock'em, sock'em, robots month from a volume perspective, really. So to see June be the second highest on record in the history of the business, that's something many people did not expect. So we're in rarefied territory yet again. Mr. Director of Risk, we'll start with you. It's been a little while since you joined us on the show. I know coming into 2021, one of your questions as well was, you know, can this party keep going from a volume perspective. It seems like at least so far for the first half of the year, Mr. Director of Risk, the answer is a resounding yes, sir. Yeah, so so trades lead to trades, right? When people start learning about options, you know, they're trading outright calls and outright puts, and then they take a step forward and, and start trading simple call spreads and put spreads. And then after that, once the cover, comfort level increases, you start trading, you know, more multi-leg type spreads, butterflies and condors. And then if you get into more advanced stages, you start legging out of those call spreads and put spreads that are embedded. So I can see how the volume is continuing to increase. Um, aside from the meme stock stuff, it, it's because people are getting more and more educated and they're starting to learn about options. And I think they're becoming more and more advanced. And I think this trend is going to keep keep going, especially with the advent of more and more advisors using options and teaching their clients how to hedge their portfolios, et cetera. So I'm not surprised. I mean, I think there's been a great job in the industry overall. And that's something that we have noticed, you know, over the last few years on the conferences are going to start kicking off again. But even, you know, if you didn't notice during the COVID thing, how many people had webinars or Zooms? I mean, they were crazy. I mean, they were all the time now because they're easy to do and you don't have to fly. I mean, granted, I miss physically going to a conference, which I think you guys do, and, and you know, and, and catching up with old friends. But the amount of, of of education out there on hedged equity, option products, um, options in general has been off the charts. And so, yeah, that, all that does is build confidence, and you should see this trend continue. 
Mr. Matt, same question for you. Kind of the the question everyone had coming into this year and for many of the past months has been, can the party keep continuing? I know some of your your indicators were showing maybe some of that retail interest was flagging a bit, but the numbers for June still managing to uh, remain robust there, Mr. Matt. Yeah, what I uh, I thought June, I mentioned it a little bit earlier in the show, June was when the uh, the peak of the small calls uh, happened. And, you know, as, as, as Chris was saying, you know, trades lead to trade. So, uh, in, you know, that was there was a lot of uh, driving of that skew going up from retail. And, and I think that that uh, uh, drove a bunch. You know, I, I see things a lot also from a fintech perspective and the, the technology is just getting so much better. I mean, our, our stuff, you know, we're, we're working hard to keep up. Uh, with all of the tools that people have out there, all the data that people have out there, all the uh, access to the markets and the APIs. And, and I mean, you could now run, you know, we're running automated strategies for people, uh, you know, based on rules. And, you know, you could get a lot of trades into the market now. And I, I think that it has to be, uh, you know, just leading to these volume figures that we're seeing that are that are just so high. Uh, you know, you'll also see in June, we had a couple corrections and that's when the bars, the, the volume bars just jump up. Those those corrections, everyone's jumping in to, to hedge or chase or or or, or whatever. There, we see so much volume on those days. So we had a couple of those in June. And, um, you know, so I think all, the three of those things together, you know, some, some mini corrections, uh, these the retail uh, buying those small calls. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, just the, the market it, it itself, uh, you know, moving around a bit, uh, earnings coming up, you know, I, that th- this earnings uh, uh, and the technology uh, and involved in allowing people to get to the market so easily is just caused this huge influx of, of trades. And, uh, you know, it's great to see uh, and you know we're we're definitely uh, seeing upticks just in web visits and, and searches. So uh, you know all across the options spectrum, uh, you know you're seeing more interest. Mark does appear to be the case. You can't argue with the numbers there, and they are robust yet again for June. As we keep on rolling into our next segment, it's time to get educational. It is time for Options 101. It's time to learn how to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. everybody welcome to options 101 the portion of the show where we attempt to do a little education here try to hold your hand through some basic and sometimes a little bit more advanced options concepts explain how you can utilize them in your clients portfolios today's options 101 inspired by a listener question this came in from aljo aljo says thank you very much for producing the advisor's option well you're welcome aljo so this show really makes my month when it comes out (laughs) i have a question for the show what does the Oracle of New Hampshire? Oh, Matt, this is uh, up your alley. This is for you here. What does the Oracle of New Hampshire think about using ratio one by two put spreads to hedge spy right now? Maybe short one, two to five percent out of the money put, then buying two, eight to ten percent out of the money puts against it. Do you like that as a protective strategy? Also, how far out can you reasonably use that strategy? It would seem like the value of the extra put diminishes as you go farther out in time. So I'm thinking somewhere in the one to two month range, maybe three months at the outside. Thanks again. You guys are the best. Well, great question. You guys are the best, really, out there, listeners, who send in such great questions. So it seemed like, given that question, some of the other ones we've been receiving of late, it might be a good time to revisit this topic in general, the concept of ratio spreads. We have done them in the past. Go dig into the archives, listeners. But it's been a while. It's been nearly two years since we've really kind of touched on this topic. And markets have moved a wee bit since then. Uh, We are at some pretty lofty valuations out there right now. So people, understandably, are looking for ways to generate some aggressive protection and maybe doing so without having to pay a ton for it. And that's where the ratio put spread really comes in. Let's do a basic example. Then I'll get each of your thoughts 
on the put spreads. And then we'll kind of go a little deeper into what Aljo is asking about some specifics here. Uh, so listeners, if you're not familiar with what we're talking about here, you know, let's go back to everyone's favorite. Let's go back to XYZ. Trading at $100 right now. You have a client who has some, maybe they're a little bit concerned about some near-term downside, but they don't want to liquidate the position. Maybe they have tax reasons. Maybe they, just, they still think there could be some upside as well. Whatever reason, they don't want to sell. So now you have some options, pun intended. You can go out and hedge it. In our example, the one-month 95 strike put is trading for a dollar. You could certainly go and buy that, and you have protection for a month. You're going to be stopped out effectively. Your break-even there is at $94, so that's where you're stopped out. And then, of course, you're paying effectively 1% of the cost of your position or the value of your position to protect it for a month. You know That could be seen as a lot. So it's up to you whether you think that's worth it or not. Now, another way you could go, in our example, the 90 strike put is trading for 50 cents. So now we could do kind of what Aljo is asking about. Instead of just buying the 95 put, maybe you're concerned about a little bit more aggressive of a sell-off than just kind of drifting down to 95, maybe blowing through the 90 handle, maybe down to like an 85 or so. In which case, maybe a one-by-two put spread may be the way to go here. In this case, you could sell the 95 put for a dollar and also turn around and use that use the proceeds from that trade to buy two of the 90 puts and so now you have a very different scenario now if it drops down to that 95 strike range that's of course you're going to start losing a little bit of money there so if it's, if it's a near-term sell-off maybe this isn't the trade for you but if it's an aggressive sell-off now you have a different scenario because this trade has a break even that's much lower down at $85 now, but once it gets below $85, guess what happens? Unlike the other trade, which just stops you out, when it keeps dropping below that 85 level, you're actually making money every tick that goes below that. So hence the long two element of this. So this is not the thing to put on if you think the market's going to gently drift down to a minimal range. This is for, you want to have this in your back pocket for that really rainy day, that maybe not a black swan, but pretty aggressive <laughs> sell-off to the downside. So that's just a very basic, very straightforward example of what a ratio spread is. Let's go around the horn, get everyone's general thoughts, and we'll get into some more specifics. Maybe Mr. Director of Risk will start with you. What are your overall thoughts on the short one, long two, or any kind of ratio put spread there? Do you like them, and what are your general use cases for them? So I do like them. I'm going to call this one a back spread since we're net long more units than short. Um, I, I think they're – so I like to do these a little further out where you have six to nine months to expiration, and then you have a three to six-month holding period, again, depending upon what your entry was, six to nine. Um, the biggest mistake people do is, again, you are net long options on this. So, yes, you do want a move, a fast move. Obviously, you want the move to happen faster, but the biggest problem that I see is people don't monetize these things. Um, they're a great way to take advantage of skew. They're great ways to take advantage of, of um, you know, volatility if you're the other way around. But again, the, the the biggest mistake is not monetizing these, especially in this case where it's where long more than short. Um, and then you're right on the move. You don't book the profits, and then you see it all fizzle out because the long options, you know, tend towards zero as we get closer to expiration. Right? Um, I think. You know, if you did the ratio spread where you're long one, short two, I think those are this, which is just the opposite of this trade. Uh, I think those are really good for equities where you have certain price points that you want to enter into a stock. So you'll get that zone of participation on the downside in addition to, you know, a, a good value level according to your analysis. So yeah, I do like them. They, they, they blow up, the back spreads blow up, but you have to monetize these things. It's one thing you can't sit on the sidelines and, and celebrate that you have a win unless you take certain action because they'll, they will deflate and they will deflate very quickly. Yes, uh, options terminology can be confusing, listeners. Backspread is another term that is frequently used for this type of trading. Mr. Matt, we'll get your general thoughts first, and we'll dive into the, some of the specifics here. What are your thoughts on the old backspread, a.k.a. the ratio put spread? When do you like them? When do you not like them, sir? Well, I think, uh, as usual, Chris hit the nail on the head there. Um, for shorter term, I do not like them at all. As a matter of fact, one of the best uh, strategies that we back test is the the opposite of that is uh, the the ratio buying one selling selling two um, so um, you know you have to do it longer longer term as as Chris pointed out in order for it to really uh, add uh, it, you know there's a lot of people want to be in the market but they don't they, they see these lofty levels 
uh, I've been looking at, you know, just to digress for a second, you know, something like a uh, a call calendar. So it's not that expensive, especially with vol pretty low. And if the market drifts up, you get some benefit. And if it goes down, you don't lose that much. Now, the, one of the problems with this strategy is it's often about a three to one um, ratio of, that you could lose. If it, if it ends at, you know, what, what this looks like is like a little triangle under underneath uh, break even for you. So that is, you know, usually like in this case, you could lose, you know, you're putting it on for even, you could lose five bucks on it, you know, if it drifts, if the market drifts down. So, uh, you know, this is, and I, and I've, uh, I've put a few of these on, um, and it just, they, they always end up going right where I don't want them to go. <laughs> so I, I, I might have a little bit of bias there, but, um, yeah, I, 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 for the most part, I, I'm, I, I don't like these these trades for the reasons that it's a great question from Aljo, by the way. Um, but this is not the the way I'd like to go. the The way I like to go is way out of the money, longer term puts. Um, you could you could over hedge them, meaning you could buy more than uh, you really need for for your stock because they're going to be so far out of the money. Like you th think five delta, think one year or more. Um, those are the ones that really blow up. And especially if you're putting them on now when, when volatility is re relatively low. Um, and then you could also have some type, you know, because Algio wants to have some type of a, of a short uh, option in there. Then you could put a short put spread, something like that, that will, uh, you know, help you with your, your, uh, your theta. You're not going to have, uh, you know, hopefully at these lower vol levels, you're not going to have uh, too much, uh, you know, vega exposure. So, I mean, you have exposure, but you, you kind of you might want it at this point. So that's why I like the if you, if, if you want to be in the market, get go those you know check out some of the, of the back tests, but those 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 farther out small uh, small delta puts over hedge them and then maybe put some income in there when the market's kind of quiet like it is you know relatively uh, been over the last few weeks. Um, you know, then you can you, you could generate some income while still having a, a you know a bunch of protection. Doesn't look like it because it's so far out of the money, but those things really blow up when the market turns against you, Mark. Yeah, let's get into some specifics here. That was that was great, by the way. There, Matt and Director Briss Bullfield. Just let me just put the caveat out there. By the way, this is just a, that example we gave was just for <laughs> explanation purposes. It's an absurd example by just about any definition. If you had a client who wanted to do that, I would hope you would talk them out of that because if they're that worried about the stock selling off enough to make that one by two put spread pay off, they should probably get the hell out of X Y Z. Right. So it was more just so to inform you what the trade is. I would not expect anyone to do a one month, one by two like that. That would be that would be kind of asking for it, it would seem like. But that said, Aljo did ask and he has that specifically in his question. He says he thinks the value of the extra put hedge diminishes as you go farther out in time. Now, interesting, both you and Chris kind of said the opposite. So I'm kind of curious. Maybe we'll start with you, Chris. Aljo asks, he says he thinks the extra put hedge diminishes as you go farther out in time. I'm thinking somewhere in the one to two month range, maybe three months at the outset. Chris, you kind of said the opposite. So let's start there. Why do you like the one by twos much farther out? I think you said in the uh, six to nine months range, somewhere in that range. Well, you're going to lose the value of those long, that long. Uh, at the end of the day, you're short a put spread and then long a put. So if you want to take, you know, when you do position breakdown, you want to take out of your portfolio the least risky stuff. And in, in this little portfolio that we have, the least risky is the short put spread, right? That's a limited risk strategy. So then really, it, again, you know, when I teach traders is like, you've got all these options and all these different strikes and different maturities. But at the end of the day, you've got to understand what one trade, what one trade do you have to make to neutralize your risk? If that's all, the only chance you got was to make one trade, what would it do? What would it be to neutralize the majority of your risk? And so for this position, it's your longer put. So what do you need to do to neutralize as much risk? You can't, you're not going to neutralize all the risk, but what do you need to do to neutralize as much risk as possible? And it's really worrying about that put. And what general rule do we have when you're long options? Well, you don't want to buy front month options. You don't want to buy stuff that's decaying on you. And that's the reason I tend to like to do these things with a little bit more time, hoping that I'm right, that the, the event will happen sooner rather than later. And then I don't have to contend with the decay of that long extra option. And the lower delta of the longer out of the money kind of option that doesn't bother you? The lower delta doesn't. I, again, this is where... 
you know, this is where other analysis is going to have to come in. I, I'm not worried about the lower delta stuff. You're, you're putting this on to make a lot of money, right? You're, you're putting this on for you no one is selling put spreads to make tons and tons of money. That's that's more of an income steady generator type trade. But when you have that extra put on, it's it's you're you're adding the okay, I want to make a little bit of money through a short put spread, but I got a lottery ticket on this as well. And that's really where you're going to make the money, right? So that's that's the one like I said, the first thing I said is a, if you're right, you better have some type of monetization program with this. And and Matt has always been dead on when he says every time he talks about the little five delta stuff, you know, nine months to one year, he's totally right. Those have a huge bang for, for your buck. If you want bang for your buck, you trade that five to 10 delta stuff, um, even maybe up to 15 delta tops, because those are the guys that are going to really, really expand, right? You've got all these other higher order Greeks that'll start kicking in. And those really expand during times of crisis. And that's when you make the big money. Well, Mr. Matt, you are explicitly referenced in this question. You kind of mentioned something similar to what Chris said there about preferring a little bit longer term. So if you want to expand on that a little bit, have at it. And also, Aljo has some specifics here. He likes to set it up. He likes to do short one around somewhere, he says, in the 2 to 5% out of the money range, and then buying two somewhere in the 8 to 10% out of the money range. Uh, what are your thoughts on that range of spread as well? Do you have any preference there where you're setting it up, Matt? Uh, like, like I said, that it, it's <laughs> the opposite uh, of that trade has done uh, phenomenally well over uh, over a long time. So I, 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 I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan. I mean, and, and Chris brings up a, a, an excellent point. You, you know, break down your uh, break down your position too, and then you know what what Chris meant by that was where you're really going to make the money and really protect yourself is in that leftover put that's the one that could go to in, almost infinity so that's what you're that's what you're thinking about and i and i get it that's what uh, aljo is, is thinking about but in these times when the market's kind of rallying and the the volatility is kind of low <clears throat> you could go out a lot farther wait for a, a big event to happen because you, you're also going to get the the vega aspect um, as well as some delta from when those uh, when the market starts going down. Now, I should also say that one of the toughest times for backtesting protection was December of 2018. And what happened in that time is the market went down pretty precipitously, but the volatility didn't come up very much. So those small, in that case, those small uh, those small puts didn't do as well as we would have liked and and as well as they've done in, in, in other times. What did well uh, in that period, and you mentioned that earlier too, Mark, is you know when if, if the market's just drifting down like that, Aljo's uh, point, uh, this one by two is not going to do very well. What you know what does well is either a uh, you know what we've been testing, is more of a, a put calendar where you, it where the market drifts down towards the short put and you still have the long put in, increasing in value and the short put uh, ultimately expires worthless. So that's, you know, in, in that type of an environment on a drift down, um, you know, it, it, that's when it might make sense to have uh, a, a different type of a strategy to help you out help out the 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 out of the money long puts but um you know i hate to say i don't like this strategy but uh, i don't like this strategy um you know because it's just it takes so much for it, it it to do well and you know i again i like to i i just have my long puts on way out of the money uh monetize some when when, when the market uh turns down um and then get, and buy some extra ones when the when the volatility comes down and then you could have this, the opposite of this strategy um, on if you have a bunch of units down below, this is actually, you know, the, the, they call the, the one by two where you're long, a, a one by two backspread that when you're short, a one by two ratio. So it's it, just to get the, the, um, the way you talk about it down is, you know, when you have the ratio on, when you're short or put, you have to have some un underneath, but those are, that's actually a pretty good strategy to do. Uh, you know, when the markets, uh, you know, just in, in almost anything except for a, for a steep sell off. So so, um, you know, I, I think it's a great question. But uh, and, he's, you know, he's, he's really thinking about where to do it and, and all that. But it, and unfortunately, 
in in practice in back tests it just uh, th this is not strategy that you want to do to to get those uh, results that he's thinking about mark well, great question there, Al Joe. Maybe some some food for thought there on your question. And since you guys are doing so great with the questions, let's keep it rolling right on into our office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the office hour. See how many more you guys are so patient, always sending in such great questions, waiting patiently for your answers. Let's get to some new listeners here joining us as well, which is always fun. First off, we got Mike S. He says, hello, great program. Glad, so glad that I found it. Well, welcome. Welcome to the show, Mike. You have a lot of, a lot of great back episodes to enjoy there. You know, he has a question that is kind of, uh, kind of the go-to question. For a lot of advisors out there, and maybe maybe the wrong question. Maybe we'll get to that in a second. He says, what would you say is a realistic allocation to options in a traditional 60-40 portfolio right now? Is 5% too much? Thanks again. Looking forward to digging into the archives of this program. Well, Mike, I, again, so glad you discovered the show. Enjoy those archives. I think you're going to hear some interesting takes on this exact question in said archives. But the reason why I say that maybe it's the wrong question, this is something we touched on many times on the show in the past, you know, the notion that there is this allocation for options. People often think of it, they think of options and they kind of, I've said it before on the show, they kind of throw it into the alts ghetto with everything else, oh, managed futures and all these other things that don't go to get, it's all in the alts, your oil well exposure, whatever the heck it is. That's all in your alts and that should be a, your 5% allocation, right? But in reality, as we talked about on the show many times, you can use options for many more things. They don't need to be just your alts allocation. They could be for example, your long equity allocation could be through stock substitution using options or could be maybe using some short puts to expect and try to get some long equity positions that you could have covered calls against your long equity. So the notion that 5% is too much, I'd say 5% is nowhere near enough. You need, you need to really use options. 5% is not going to generate the returns that you want, the, the, you know, the incremental gains that you need to make them worthwhile to your clients. So yeah, you need to really rethink the entire use case of options, which is why I say maybe that question is not exactly the right one, but a good one to discuss here on the show. Mr. Director of Risk, we'll start with you on this one. This is kind of the fundamental question, right? This is one of the reasons why this show was created to address this topic. So what do you have to say to Mike and everyone else out there who's wondering, hey, you know, is 5%, is that a sufficient allocation to get my options ball rolling, sir? Well, you're right about your show here, and you've done a great job over the years. So I'll 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 answer this very top level. I don't think an allocation, a five percent allocation to any asset class, is too much. Okay, so that's a very j broad answer. I think the question really is, okay, if I'm going to allocate X percent, and we'll call it five in this example, to options, what do you want those options to do? And we just talked about you know ratio spreads and back spreads. I mean, you're going to allocate all five percent to a back spread or a ratio spread, or are you going to allocate to some structure? especially fitting this into the 60-40 portfolio to maybe other alternative investments that have hedged equity already embedded. And then if that's the case, then I think an allocation should be much larger than just 5%, right? You know, there's we could talk about the 60-40 portfolio all day here. And then what, what have we learned over the last few years? Well, there are flaws to it. It worked, you know, when it came out in 1950 for many, many years. But as we all know on this call and everybody, you know, listening is – Markets continue to evolve. I mean, Matt gave a great example of how they're trying to keep up with technology. He's a technology firm. So I was like very shocked that he said that. But you know what? That's being truthful. And I'm not going to say that I, I've had to reinvent myself in this business for the last 25 years. A trade will work for a few years and then it doesn't work anymore. But you don't, you don't, you don't put it in the trash can. You put it on the shelf. And what you need to do is recognize market environments to when you take – it's like an old book, right? Oh, hey – I feel like reading this old book that I, you know, I got pleasure and enjoyment once upon a time, but the market environment is now there where I want to take that off the shelf, dust it off, maybe tweak it, do some new back testing, use the new tech, latest technology that Matt is developing to continue to develop yourself 
as a trader. And that's that's involved studying, listening to shows like this, you know, going to the OIC and doing all their classes, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, I don't think 5% is too much to any asset allocation. I think the question is, what do you want that 5% to do to your overall portfolio? Mr. Uh, Matt, same question for you. Let's leave aside the 60-40. I didn't even touch on that. That's a whole other show. In fact, we have discussed that in the past. Go check out the archives, Mike, and everyone else who wants to know our thoughts on the traditional 60-40 portfolio and whether or not maybe that's a little bit antiquated these days. Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. But again, a conversation for another day. But Mr. Matt, focusing in just on the 5% allocation, what are your thoughts there, sir? Well, uh, you know, if they're talking about 5%, 5%, as Chris was saying, to a specific strategy like, you know, protection, uh, you know, that's one thing. Uh, the, the, you know, the 60-40, I, I know we could talk about for, for days, but, you know, it's supposed to protect you when, when the market turns. Again, the only guarantee is, is that puts uh, are going to pay off uh, in a contractual relationship to the stock. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, if, if he's talking about things to to protect um, a portfolio, uh, you know, think about puts. Is five percent too much? Yeah, it might be, but um, you, you know, it depends what what type of, of put strategies that that you have. And when you're allocating uh, to an options uh, a portfolio, that could actually augment um, you know a a sixty forty portfolio. For example. Uh, you know, one of our signals that came up, uh, TLT selling a put spread, so actually getting long in in TLT and getting um, theta, and you know, it's, it, and getting income to pay for it. You know, so I mean, it, you could do things with bonds, you could do things with equities that are you know non traditional, not not just delta one where you're long it. Um, you know, you could have uh, uh, you could have a theta decay working in your favor getting income uh, if there's not much volatility. You could have protection on both of them. You could even protect your bond uh, portfolio with, with puts uh, as well. We, we, we have some back tests on that. So there's, there's a lot more to think about than just you know, 5%. What is, what is that? Like it, you know, it could be a protection. It could be income. There's, and, and I would actually say it should be a lot more than that. You could, with your options, you could set how you want the payoff pictures to look. And so, uh, you know, as, as investors become uh, much more uh, qualified to use these options, um, we're seeing a lot more people use them to get the returns that they're desiring more. Yeah, great question. Again, we could probably spend, and we have spent many episodes discussing these various aspects in the past. Uh, check out the archives. I'm glad to see you're going to do that, Mike. Yes, but yeah, I think we're all on board with that. 5% is 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 just barely dipping your toes into the water is what we're talking about here. It needs a lot more to really really make options have an impact on your portfolio and also kind of to to utilize them in the proper way. So, yeah, 5% not going to get the ball rolling for. It. Next up, we got some related questions. So I guess we'll kind of bunch these together. First off, we have Mateus. Mateus says, "Have you thought about an episode explaining how advisors can implement these options techniques using utilizing crypto options?" Uh, the pros and cons, tips and tricks, how these strategies work or don't work in crypto, et cetera. Then we have a looks like a related question here from, I like this handle, Bob Dang. Thanks for the pro content. Oh, a new a new pro member. Well, welcome to the family there, Bob Dang. says, thanks for the pro content. Really finding it useful. Well, thank you. A question for you. Do you think that it is smart to include crypto options in your portfolio or would you wait until it is a little more widespread? If I were to start using it, what crypto would you suggest that I begin with? How do I begin to find an advisor who I can trust that understands it? Ooh, there's a lot of a lot of layers to that onion there as well. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chris, you haven't been on in a little bit, so you haven't had a chance to pick your brain recently about cryptos. So maybe we'll start with you. I know in the past you haven't been the the most receptive to this space. So A, has that changed? What is your outlook in general on crypto? And then B, we're getting a lot more of these questions. It's kind of inescapable about the overlap of the advisor space and crypto. So what do you think about that? And should they maybe be utilizing some options in those crypto hills, sir? So I think crypto, for the most part, is in its initial stages. Um, it's the, a lot of the trading is not regulated like we're used to with stock, fixed income. And, and the derivative and options exchanges that we have here. So we've also learned that a lot of the underlyings, aka the individual cryptos, may or may not necessarily have 
some type of value or backing or whatever you want to call it behind that. So that in and of itself is a risk. So I think someone who is going to be trading derivatives on crypto has to do double the homework. Now, specifically with the option pricing that I've seen in some of the cryptos and some of the option exchanges that are kind of out there, um, there is a tremendous amount of volatility of volatility in crypto. Obviously, you've got uh, cryptos moving 5, 10, 20 percent in a very short period of time. So that's very difficult to implement spreads, call spreads, put spreads, cal- uh you know, butterflies, condors, you're just not going to see the expansion with that kind of volatility. That's one of the problems with trading those kind of spreads or those kind of strategies and say, even in the VIX, you know, people think they're going to get this expansion and they really don't because the volatilities are so high. So you have to be careful about trading the volatility of volatility. Um, I have no comment on any specific crypto. I'm trying. I mean, yes, you're right. I, I was I was anti last year. I started looking at it. I think for me as a as a technical analysis guy, I think cryptos trade very technically um, because there's nothing there. There's no fundamentals really, right? They, they're they trading off of, off of pictures. And so if you're a technical analyst, I, I think, yeah, you should probably give crypto a look-see, um, but make sure you have some good risk management rules behind that. You're not the first person I've talked to who has been very impressed with how technicals tend to apply in the land of crypto. It's uh, it's an interesting space from that perspective as well. Matt, I know you've had your kind of back and forth, your dalliances with the crypto space as well. You were an early adopter out there these days, maybe a little bit more reticent. What are your thoughts here from Mateus and Bob Dang about the the Venn diagrams of crypto and advisors and also the layer of options, what role they should play in there, sir? Well, I do think that uh, investors should consider a percentage of their uh, assets uh, for crypto. Uh, there are some, some uh, good benefits of that. Um, you know, if something were to happen to the fiat underlying currencies, uh, if you needed to travel quickly, um, and just the, you know, uh, amount of interest that, that, that we're starting to see or, or have continued to see, especially in, uh, you know, if Apple, uh, with all the cash they have starts to buy some crypto, um, that could be pretty crazy. But then you have the opposite side where Yellen is talking about, more regulations for these pegged uh, cryptos like uh, Tether and stuff that uh, they think there's some shenanigans going on with, um, you know, multiple liquidity for uh, crypto, for, for Bitcoin and such. But, you know, there is a, the uh, underlying market, the, the option market and Ledger X, um, you know, there's there, there are decent markets out there, decent o- open interest. And, um, you know, we're looking at the skew and we're, um, you know, ORATS is going to be, you know, when we start getting more data, we'll we'll start uh, you know dipping our toe into uh, in, 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 into those uh, those lands. You had Simon Ahoha on, and he's uh, he's doing a lot with with crypto and, and volatility. So there's a you know a lot more adoption, and you know people should should start seriously looking at it. You know, um, there's you know once you once you own crypto, there's uh, you know so much volatility there. Uh, you could do some strategies. There are some uh, opportunities to, depending on, you know, your positioning and in your outlook. So there's a, there, there's quite a few things that you can do. Uh, and I, I think there's also some interesting correlations going on. Uh, you know, you talk about 60-40. Well, you've also got crypto to throw in there too. So, um, you know, I, 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 it's especially interesting for me now that that there are options underlying um, crypto Um you're, you're right. I've been involved for, for, for many years, uh, kind of ambivalent, but, you know, uh, involved. And so, um, you know, I, I do think it's going to be a part. And I, I think uh, conversations that we're going to be having in the, in the upcoming years, um, you know, it's just going to be a given that people are, are uh, advisors are going to be able to talk about uh, crypto. And, and, you know, it's, it's uh, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin are the ones that trade uh, options. So, you know, those are, those are more, more of the go-to ones for, um, f- for the questions that Bob Ding and Mateus has asked, Mark. Unfortunately, that music means we're coming to a close here. Man, how an hour flies by when you're having fun. For Mateus and Bob and everyone else who has these questions about crypto, I do want to point out we do have an entire show on this network aimed at this space. It is called the Crypto Rundown. We break down all this stuff about crypto options, how you can utilize them, and Matt is right for a lot of the U.S. registered advisors, which is the lion's share of the audience of this program and their clients. You don't have that many options, pun intended, 
from a crypto derivatives perspective. You can't really trade on the big dogs like Deribit. They're not really uh, approved for use here in the U.S. So your choices are the big contracts over there at CME, which are very expensive. They had added a micro future. So we'll see how that looks. Of course, no options there yet. And then, as Matt mentioned, Ledger X, which is an interesting platform, growing in volume, growing in liquidity. They were on our Crypto Rundown program not too long ago. I encourage you to check that out as well, that episode. And they mentioned it's still for them because it's a physically settled contract. The lion's share of their volume is still mostly on the covered call side. Folks looking to get a little bit of income, a little bit of yield out of their Bitcoin holdings and some protective puts. So that's your use case. That is a good platform for you. They're still looking to increase and broaden that use case and broaden that liquidity. And over time, I do expect that to happen. So keep an eye on that. So good stuff there, Mateus and Bob Dang. And everyone else who wrote in with questions, Alger, we want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing, for listening live, for sending in those questions, everything else that you do. Keep it coming. And before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the Director of Risk. Mr. Director of Risk, you folks have been busy since the last time we chatted. What's cooking in the land of Swan, and where can folks go to learn more? Yeah, we have been busy here. We formed a partnership recently with Pacer ETF. So we now have nine listed ETFs in our structured outcome series. Um, and those are broken down through a conservative, moderate, and what we call a flex defined outcome risk reward profile. And then additionally, we have a 10th ETF with them currently. Um, that is our fund of funds and where we kind of combined all these different structures into an optimal risk reward profile, depending upon market conditions. And then we have our own internal ETF, uh, the Swan Hedged Equity US Large Cap. And we recently surpassed 75 million in assets under management there. That ticker is HEGD. And if you want more information about that ETF, you can go to etfs.swanglobalinvestments.com. Hedged. I like that ticker, sir. Well done. Swan Global is the place to go. And of course, Mr. Matt, folks have questions about various strategies and the most efficient use case they're in. Maybe they want to do some back testing of their own. Maybe they want to check out earnings analysis or anything else that you do. Where should they go? What should they do, Mr. Matt? Mark, we have a new website up, so please go check it out. Oh, I was just going to ask you if that's live. So it's live. Okay, I'm going to kick the tires on that. Yeah, Uh, we got it up. Uh, love it. Um, it uh, explains our products a lot, a lot better, uh, more organized. Uh, you know, it's uh, we've been we've been tossing out new technology, and and now we finally have uh, our hands around it, and we have a new website up. Uh, a lot going on. Uh, you know, you mentioned back testing. We also, you know, optimize the back tests, and then once we find really good ways to trade a short put spread, for example, you know, what about timing? We have all these proprietary calculations. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of them that we use machine learning to uh, do the timing of it. That's how we found our TLT trade um, and, and other uh, options that we are, are using this, these triggers, as we call them, and machine learning. So there's a ton going on. Our real product helps us manage all that. So uh, go over to ORATS.com, check it out. Email me, Matt at ORATS, and uh, Great to have Chris on the show and uh, see you again, Mark. I'm looking at the new website right now, sir. Very nice, very clean, very eye-catching. Well done, sir. Thank you. Check it out for yourselves, listeners. Orats, O-R-A-T-S dot com is the place to go. And you know where to go for more information on the volume we were talking about earlier in the show. A lot of great education as well. It's optionseducation.org. That's the home of our friends over there at the Options Industry Council. They have great stuff there for advisors as well. Let's click on the Advisors tab, and you're off to the races with studies and analysis and all sorts of other fun stuff that you could use to arm yourself when you're talking to your clients about these crazy things called options. And on behalf of myself and the Director of Risk and Mr. Matt, everybody over there in the land of OIC, I want to thank again, thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live. If you're listening live, stay tuned. It's double pro week this week, listeners. So you're getting a double dose later on today of OPR, including a very rare live appearance of Mr. 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 Almost call him that. <laughs> of Mr. Overby there, aka the options guy, going to answer your questions live, live huddle. A little bit later today around 4 p.m. Central. So stay tuned for that as well. And, of course, all the rest of our programs on the docket for the rest of this week. Then we're coming on up. Hard to believe it's already almost August. That means it's another month and time soon for another episode of the Advisor's Option. 
Advisors Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisors Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 